welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program. Um, joining me today is uh, my regular co-host, <laughs> regular partner in crime, Dr. William Lester. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Lily. Good morning. How are you? I'm just fine. Um, apparently, he's had a very busy morning. He came on approximately five seconds before I let the rest of uh, um, the, the crowd join us today. So therefore, um, you'll know everything that we have to say today has not been practiced in advance, but <laughs> um, we kind of do know. I showed him the, uh, the PowerPoint yesterday, so he has an idea of what he's going to be talking about, and we're just going to chat about the different um, different insects out there um, that we're gonna find in our yards. I am Lily Browning. I do work for Hernando County Utilities. It often gets confused. People think I work for County Extension like Dr. Lester does. I partner with County Extension quite a bit, but um, Hernando County Utilities sends me a paycheck <laughs> in my bank and um, I'm with the uh, water conservation, public outreach. And here is my email. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at any time. Lily B, L-I-L-L-Y-B at hernandocounty.us. Dr. Lester does work for Hernando County Extension for the University of Florida. He is your very own personal horticulture agent. So if you do have questions, really the best place is to <laughs> go to his email, go to either one. If we don't know the answer, we'll ask each other. If we don't um, either one know, we will figure it out. We know a lot of smart people. And Bill's email is wlester at ufl.edu. And you can email us at any time. As I mentioned, I do work for Hernando County Utilities. I'm still trying to get my voice <laughs> back here. <coughs> um, but I utilize this University of Florida program, Florida Friendly Landscaping, to be able to encourage people to have environmentally sustainable landscapes that save water. That's one of our main focuses. But all of these other principles um, you know, eventually will help you have a more sustainable water saving, um, using less chemicals, just better for everybody type of landscape. And we're gonna talk today, we're gonna cover number six, managing yard pests responsibly. The last time we met, we also covered that when we did climbing the integrated pest management um, pyramid. And we were discussing basically control of pest insects then. Now we're gonna look at the other side of that coin. We're gonna look at our friends. <laughs> um, there's a saying out there, some people believe that, you know, all insects are bad. The only good bug is a dead bug. Absolutely not true. We wouldn't be sitting here today if there were no bugs. Um, it's all very important. Uh, they were very, vital part of our ecosystem. Here is the um, integrated pest management pyramid that we discussed in our last class, which you can find on my Facebook page or on Hernando County Government YouTube as well, if you wanna go back and check it out. But when we're talking about beneficial bugs, we are covering in that one, well, that second to the last uh, block there in the pyramid, the biological control. <clears throat> a lot of we're going to discuss many benefits that many insects provide for us. But when somebody talks about beneficial insects, what mostly gets discussed is um, how they control the bad guys. There are beneficial insects that do a lot of good, but generally in those terms, when uh, universities discuss it, they're discussing um, how they help us control the pests that are out there. 
which by the way, what is the percentage of insect pests in the world, Dr. Lester? There are approximately a million species of insects around the world, and only 1% of them are true pests. All the rest are either beneficial in one way or another, or neither, uh, particularly beneficial and definitely uh, not. So well, when we talk about benefits, um, we're gonna discuss what benefits, we call them beneficial, what are the benefits <laughs> that they're providing us? A lot of them do pollinate. That's a good benefit. A lot of them, air, or some of them, aerate our soil. Um, and as Bill kind of alluded to, the ones that um, aren't really doing anything, maybe, you know, they're just part of the food chain. They're not causing any harm. They're not necessarily helping us in a battle against bad guys, but they are providing a food source. They improve the neighborhood. What do I mean by that? I mean the neighborhood of your backyard, of your front yard. They make a more balanced ecosystem. But in general, what gets talked about when we refer to beneficial insects is the fact that they eat the bad guys. <laughs> that is, you know, some of the main things that get um, spoken of when we talk about pest insects to us. First of all, the insect world contains no duality. <laughs> they have no concept of good and evil. <laughs> that is, so what is um, good and bad in our minds, what's considered a pest is something that interferes with something we want to eat, number one, like a crop pest, or our health, um, you know, they may carry diseases or sting us or something like that, or they eat the things that we want around to be attractive to us, um, or they in some way harm the environment in general. They're out of control with their numbers, there's no checks and balances, that is what we call the bad guys, the pests. And so then our allies are the many, 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 many insects. If you let nature do its thing, that, you know, um, are predators of those particular pests. Here's something I found, Bill, uh, an old fox. Yeah, I, I saw that on Facebook about a week or two ago. That's probably yeah. where you that's where I found it. I found a far side uh, group, which is kind of fun because it brings me back to the 80s. But um, this is an actual uh, Larson one. Not all of them on that uh, group are. But I thought it was pretty funny. This, and maybe it was a glimpse of my future um, <laughs> when, when he drew it, because my husband's name is Henry. So therefore, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> You know, at some point, do you feel like you have been tied up and held captive by the aphids or the other pests in your yard? Um, when we say uh, pests are bad guys, they're not going to go to these extremes. But maybe you do feel bound up and not knowing what to do about them. So we're going to we're going to cover a little bit about that. Bees are. They're the cool kids aren't they? Bees and butterflies are the cool kids in the beneficial insect world. And really, they can and have had their own classes all to themselves. I don't think there's any bees that um, consume other insects. Are there, Dr. Lester? Depends on what your definition of bees are. Uh, wasps are very important in biological control. They feed and feed on a lot of caterpillars, help keep them under control. But actual bees, uh, cuckoo bees attack and basically steal other bees' nests. But no, generally true bees don't catch and carry off and eat other insects. Yes. Many um, of these on this list are pure um, nectar and um, pollen feeders. Right, and they are wonderful beneficial insects. And while I'm talking, can you switch to that other microphone that, that you have that sounds better? <laughs> um, it sounds like you're talking through, you know, a Campbell's soup can with that <laughs> microphone. 
Um, what I wanted to really bring out about bees very shortly is, you know, we're all in love with bees. Bees are having their heyday right now. Bees are very, very, very important. Um, and they play a very important role. Um, but I want to make you aware of the amount of native bees that we have here in the state. And what I'm listing here are generalities within the sweat bee, you know, family. There's lots of other different types, you know, subtypes and things like that. So lots of wonderful native bees out there. The only um, uh, social uh, native bee would be a bumblebee. Isn't that correct, Dr. Lester? Yes, can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Um, bumblebees are pollinators as are all the other ones, but the way that bumblebees pollinate a flower is a little bit different. And some flowers really depend on bumblebees because a bumblebee will actually vibrate or bumble. That's how it gets its name. So when it's visiting a flower, it's vibrating also, and some flowers have to be pollinated by bumblebees to actually get the pollen loose and the pollen on the correct part of the next flower. So there are crops, uh, blueberries are a good example. Uh, European honeybees are terrible pollinators if you have blueberries. You really need bumblebees to pollinate blueberries. And up north, pumpkins, we can grow pumpkins in Florida, but they grow them commercially up north. There is a type of bee, um, a pumpkin bee, I think. They're really, I'm not even sure if they're in Florida, but they're up north. And that's, they do 95% of the pollination of the pumpkins up there. So some plants depend on very, very specific pollinators. And um, we all love the European honeybees, but they, they are, um... I was actually talking to somebody the other day who didn't realize that they're non-native. That doesn't mean they're bad at all. They, they are introduced, they're not invasive. Right. And what it was, was, you know, when the Europeans came over and the crops that they were growing, because they had been keeping bees, you know, in the Bible it talks about keeping bees and stuff. It's a, it was a well-known practice. Um, so the Europeans knew how to keep bees, but they were bringing crops over here that had never been planted over here before. So these native bees may not have recognized those plants and been, you know, very efficient compared to what the Europeans were used to. So they just, you know, brought the honeybees with them. Um, I guess our point here is um, go ahead and show love to the European honeybees, but show love to our native bees <laughs> as well they do great jobs. Some of them are teeny, teeny, tiny little things. You mentioned wasps. So here we are actually going to talk about something that is actually a predator of some of our pest insects. Now, when you see some of these and we're going to say what they are a predator of, there may be things on that list that you wish they did not prey upon. But unfortunately, you know, nature doesn't work that way. Remember I said, you know, they don't understand any concepts of good and evil or what we like or don't like. They just, you know, exist and they consume. So it's all part of the, the circle of life and part of nature. But what can you tell us about a lot of these parasitic wasps? Because people hear wasp and they don't want them around, either because they think they're going to get stung or like the first thing on that list there, if they're trying to uh, breed butterflies, they don't want the caterpillars um, destroyed by these parasitic wasps. Well, first of all, these are not um, like paper wasps or other wasps you might be familiar with around your house. They don't sting. Uh, these wasps are about the size of a grain of pepper. So they're very, very small. And there are a huge number of very specialized species of parasitoid wasps. And what they do is they lay their eggs in a specific insect. And the maturing wasp kills the insect from the inside out. And then either they pupate inside of the victim insect or on the outside, like the picture right here is a caterpillar. That's a tomato hornworm, which if you anybody here grows tomatoes in your garden, you're going to get tomato hornworms, so the great big green caterpillars. 
that eat your plants. But the wasp eggs that were laid inside this caterpillar, the wasps make a little cocoon on the outside of the caterpillar. That's what those little white things that look like grains of rice are. And eventually each one of them is gonna open up and a new little wasp the size of a grain of pepper is gonna fly away. Now, almost every insect out there has a parasitoid wasp that can prey on it. Roaches have ensign wasps, caterpillars have a whole bunch of different species. Aphids are very commonly parasitized by several species of little tiny wasps. Stink bugs are, stink bug eggs are parasitized by a separate wasp. So there's a huge number of pest insects out there and a huge number of these little wasps that you probably never even knew existed that are helping to balance the population and keep them under control. So for people who are deliberately trying to grow caterpillars in their garden by growing the proper host plants so that they're gonna have plenty of beautiful butterflies, wasps are just a part of life to help keep the populations under control. So the more caterpillars you have, eventually the more wasps you're gonna have preying on them. And we know, um, we know, we hear all the time, you know, people trying to raise different caterpillars, they become very upset when all the caterpillars don't make it. And, you know, we, we understand that, but what's gonna happen in nature? Yes, because even if you do have um, your stereotypical paper wasps around your house or in your landscape, they will carry off caterpillars and put them in their nests and lay eggs in them. Uh, even the cicada killer, which we get, we got a lot of phone calls about this past summer. Everybody thought there were murder wasps, but the cicada mm -hmm. killers, which is a very, very large wasp, will catch cicadas, which are a very large insect, carry them off to their holes in the ground, paralyze them and lay their eggs in them. So if you're raising monarch butterfly caterpillars in your yard, sure, some of your caterpillars will naturally fall prey to wasps. Really hard, you, you can't sanitize half of nature and expect to have a successful other half of nature. It all works together. That's a good way, that's a good way to put it, yes. And the, um, anyone who's tried to raise like monarchs, they found, you know, we find this all the time, that they are finding they have more monarchs and they have the ability to feed and then they're running around like crazy trying to find different milkweed from everywhere. Well, that is, you know, just a response to the food availability, but the monarchs, all these eggs are going to hatch, um, but nature doesn't expect every one of them to make it. <laughs> you know, maybe some of the, and that's why they produce so many, and some of them, uh, may, you know, just maybe their destiny in life to be uh, soft, very digestible, swallowable, nutrient-rich meal for a baby bird. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes we just have to let nature do its thing. Here's our favorite. <coughs> this is another one of the cool kids. The um, ladybugs or the ladybird beetles. There are 98 species of these guys or girls <laughs> in uh, Florida. And I have here, see this picture on the bottom? That's why I have there, um, unlike me, I had beautiful babies. I bet and all of you had beautiful babies too. Mrs. Lady Beetle, Ladybird Beetle, <laughs> she doesn't have pretty babies. <laughs> she has pretty ugly babies. And that's a picture down below, believe it or not. So if you see that, ladybug larvae and you don't know what it is and you just automatically killed it you have killed something that is just going to vacuum up a massive amount of aphids in your garden for you so what else do you have to add dr lester that is true and i think everybody knows what a ladybug is and even when um i've been teaching uh school age children like third and fourth graders on good bugs and bad bugs, they all know ladybugs are good bugs too. And very, it's very, very true here in Florida. They, depending on the species, can feed on huge numbers of aphids, spider mites, mealybugs, um, 
sometimes thrips, scales. Some of them are kind of specialized feeders. So there is one native Florida species that doesn't look like the one in the picture here. It's pure black and about half the size of the stereotypical ladybug. And its common name is the mealybug destroyer. So if you have mealybugs on your plants and you get a few of them on there, they will just vacuum them right up. And pretty quickly, they'll clean up a problem with mealybugs naturally so that you don't have to spray or worry about it or do anything. Yep, and here are some of the things our friends, as you mentioned, some of them, um, they do like to, to eat for us. Uh, aphids, mites, scales, mealybugs, white flies, small caterpillars, beetle grubs, and all types of insect eggs. So they're like little Roombas <laughs> on, they the are. <laughs> on the back of your leaves where a lot of these pest insects hang out. And they, they eat quite a bit of them, but their babies, those ugly babies are voracious, voracious feeders too. So, you know, don't, Spray first and ask questions later. Find out <clears throat> you don't want any friendly fire out there in the garden and then, you know, shooting yourself in the foot figuratively. Here's some dragonflies and damsel flies. Um, they help us in both stages. I don't have pictures here of their larvae, but the larvae live in the water where the mosquito larvae live. So we have baby wars going on <laughs> in the water where the baby dragonflies are um, destroying the baby mosquitoes before they ever even become mosquitoes. You know, that's fantastic. Um, they also um, eat midges, sometimes butterflies, um, the adults, moths, bees, and smaller dragonflies. You see this huge eyes that this dragonfly has enables it to see everywhere except directly behind it. And not only that, it is a food source itself. That's kind of how nature works for frogs, birds, fish, and spiders. Now how um, we tell the difference, dragonflies are a lot bigger. Damselflies are pretty dainty. Um, and they also have their eyes further apart. It's hard to see from this side view, but you see the dragonfly's eyes really just take over its entire head and sticks together. The damselfly's eyes are more like over here. I, I compare them to Princess Leia's hair buns <laughs> over here. Um, the larvae eat mosquito and small aquatic insects, other arthropods. They eat flies, mosquitoes, um, beetles, caterpillars, and of course their food source too. And another way to tell them apart is, here we mentioned um, the dragons, dragonflies, sit with their wings outstretched when they're resting. And the damselflies um, have their wings kind of at the top. And Dr. Lester, I found a slide to help us demonstrate the oh, difference okay. <laughs> between a the from the past. <laughs> a damselfly and a dragonfly and how that how they are at rest. <laughs> so wasn't even looking for those. I was looking for something else. And I thought, well, this is perfect <laughs> for our program today. Um, do you have anything to add about damselflies and dragonflies? No, they're a very important part of the environment. Um, don't think that if you have dragonflies and damselflies on your property, you they'll they're going to eat all the mosquitoes and it totally controls mosquitoes. <clears throat> it's just an important piece of the whole puzzle to help keep mosquitoes under control. So between dragonflies, <clears throat> damselflies, other things that eat mosquito larvae in the water bats that eat adult mosquitoes, they all work together to help keep mosquitoes under control, at least. We're always gonna have some mosquitoes. And they catch these dragonflies, they catch their prey in midair with yeah. their claws, which is pretty, pretty cool. 
and um, they can, can fly pretty fast. I think like 30 miles an hour, something like that. Yeah, I think they're either the fastest or one of the fastest flying insects. Now the damselflies can't, they're pretty weak flyers. They just kind of float <laughs> on the airwaves <coughs> with a little bit of flying there. Um, neither one of these sting you. You might feel like they do. Um, I can remember years ago practicing for band, marching band. <laughs> In a field, you know, where it seems like a lot of these were, but there were also horse flies, and the horse flies were doing the biting. Mm -hmm. But you feel like um, because they're going so fast, they sometimes run into you, you know, you, you know, you're in their way, they do run into you. So you might feel a little bump from their pointy body, and that's just a collision. It is, you know, they have not bitten or stung you. And there we go again with the, <laughs> in case you <laughs> need to remember the damselfly <laughs> rests like this and the dragonfly rests like that. Here's a, a, a pretty one when it's an adult, the, the lacewing. I'll let you tell us about um, the green lacewings or the brown lacewings. Sure, we have both here in Florida. And you'll see the adults flying around um, outdoor lights and porch lights in the summer. Green lace wings are kind of a lime green and they have very intricate wings. You can see all the veins on them. They just kind of fly around and float around there. I don't know, maybe an inch long or less. And we do have brown lace wings here also. Brown lace wings tend to be more of a forestry insect. And you're gonna see the green ones in more of an urban or suburban environment. Their um, larva, like the one pictured up on the top picture, gobble up huge numbers of aphids, scales, mealybugs, mites, insect eggs. They're similar to ladybugs in that they eat quite a few different insects. So if it's kind of the right size, they're going to gobble it up. And But they're not to be confused with um, the lace bug. <laughs> Which yeah, is, lace, lace bug is something totally, lace bugs are a pest. They are a pest. At the lace wing is our friend. Yeah, and I mean, they're even in different insect orders. So sometimes yeah, common yeah. names for insects are not very accurate or mm -hmm. descriptive. Here's, I'd say, probably one of my favorites of all times. And if you look on the bottom there on the left, you may say, is that what those are? Because this is very common when you go outside to any kind of, you know, sandy area in your yard. To see I have them in my yard up against the fence where it stays dry generally. Yeah. And it, and it inverted like a cone in your yard. And you're like, what is this upside down anthill <laughs> doing in my yard? Well, it is a work of genius, actually. Um, and at least kids used to know all about these. They could tell you all about them because kids that have a lot of fun um, with them, it has more notoriety in the larvae stage where it looks like this and it's called an ant lion or my preferred term, a doodle bug. <laughs> and I didn't realize there's 22 different species of ant lions in Florida. But they all have these oversized jaws that project from the head. But how does that relate to these little cones that we see in the yard? They built these little cones. And why did they do that? Well, some of them, some of the species build these traps. Others just kind of hide in um, plant litter and then ambush whatever they want to eat and, and attack it. But the really ingenious ones with those pinchers up there, and they have a very, very, very rough body that um, they don't slide around in the sand. They're able to maneuver very well in the sand. So they use their body to create these pits. This is a really incredible when you think about it, that uh, something with almost no brain at all is using a tool. <laughs> you know, that just blows your mind. And what happens is ants, well, he builds it, then he 
buries himself at the bottom. And ants or maybe some other type of small insect will you know, come along and fall in. And as they're trying to get back out, they're kind of moving the sand along. You know, they're not having all that much success. And he pops out of the bottom and gobbles them up. How the kids can't, you know, would come in is they would decide to bait those little traps and, and then watch because apparently while he's doing his thing and the other insect is trying to get away, there's a whole lot of sand being blown around in there. <laughs> so it's like, you know, a pretty good activity um, to watch. <laughs> so um, when he becomes an adult, he or she, I think they're beautiful. I think that the, you know, the wings, purple and black and very lacy, are very, very beautiful, but they don't get much attention after that, despite how beautiful they are, because they're not as fun anymore. In fact, they don't even get their own name. They're only called an adult antlion. <laughs> so <laughs> I think um, these doodlebugs are a great amount of fun and they will do what we just talked about with fire ants as well. So do you have anything um, more to share about our friend the ant lion? Yes, this is another one that's just an important part of the environment. So don't think like if you have problems with ants in your yard or in your house, you need to order a bunch of doodle bugs to control them. Um, but they do, they eat ants they eat any appropriate sized insect or spider that falls into their hole. If it's the right size that they can eat it, they will. So just, and the adults you'll see during the summer, they fly around generally at night. And we have um, the one very attractive species here that has the purple at the back end of its wings. Mm -hmm. And another one that's just, that looks the same, but it's just straight brown wings. So those are the two main species that we have here in Florida. But yeah, we do have about 20 some odd species here in Florida. I would like to design a dress after this one's wings. <laughs> I think it's very pretty. Here's another one. You did not know, I'm sorry I did not warn you ahead of time. I should have put up a warning that there would be graphic images of violence <laughs> in uh, today's program. This is a pretty violent picture. Um, why don't you talk to us about wheel bugs? or assassin bugs. And what's going on in this picture? Sure, wheel bugs and assassin bugs, that covers a number of different species that are in a family of insects that are closely related to stink bugs. So they're in that same order. So how they feed is they have a sharpened mouth part that is much like um, if you're drinking from a juice box, how do you do that? You take the juice box, you take the straw, poke it in, and then you drink the juice out of the juice box. Stink bugs and wheel bugs and assassin bugs do the same thing. Stink bugs will poke their mouth part into a tomato or a plant or a branch on your hibiscus and suck the plant juices out of it, and in that way they damage it. Wheel bugs and assassin bugs will catch other insects and poke their mouth part into them and extract all the contents of that insect, and that's how they feed. Wheel bugs can get fairly large. They're kind of the larger assassin bug type insects. They can get about two inches long and they get their name because if you see in the picture, his back, the body part with the little spikes or spokes sticking out of it, looks like if you took a wheel and cut it in half and glued it to his back. So that's how they get their common name, wheel bug. And um, they can, if you catch one, and start playing with it and poking at it, he might poke you in your hand and apparently it hurts, but they're not, you know, it's one of those things, if you leave them alone, they're never ever gonna bother you. It's only if you bother them and aggravate them, you may be able to convince him to poke you. Um, they, you'll find them out usually late summer. I've seen them in the parks before, picnic tables. They do fly around at night, pretty large flying insects and they do, catch a wide variety of different insects. A lot of caterpillars, um, smaller ones will eat aphids, other ones, wh whatever insect they can catch. They'll grab it and poke their mouth part into it. 
and extract the juices that way. So what does this guy have in this picture? Oh, he has, the common name for that is a puss caterpillar. So that's a caterpillar that looks like it's furry. And a lot of people say it looks like a hairball that your cat threw up. It does look similar to that. And you do not ever want to touch one of these caterpillars if you encounter it, because some of those hairs on its body have poisonous tips and it will hurt really, really bad. And people many times end up having to go to the, see a doctor or a hospital or a clinic and not much they could do for you. Pain goes away in about 24 hours, but from what I've heard, it hurts really bad. So wheel bugs are your friends by eating puss caterpillars, which they do. And um, yeah, this, if you run across something like this, this battle royale there, you don't want to touch either one of those guys there because you will be very, very sorry. But it is nice to have our own assassin, you know, in our corner. But this battle here reminded me of something. So I, I added it here. That's kind of just yeah. what, you know, Godzilla and Mothra. <laughs> That's kind of what we have going on there. Round beetles. Okay, and this is an important um, ally to um, farmers growing crops. So what can you tell us about the, ground, the ground beetle, Dr. Lester? There are a bunch of different species of ground beetles. They're all in the family Carabidae. And if you see a beetle or catch a beetle, how you can tell is if you look at the front end, the front of its head, if its mouth parts are big, jaws is some kind of predator. He's catching something big with those jaws to eat. And different ground beetles feed on other insects. Uh, ground beetles also include tiger beetles, which are, because insects are part of the animal kingdom, tiger beetles for their size are the fastest animals on earth. So they can run really fast. They see an insect on the other side of the garden, boom, they run really fast jump on it, grab it, and eat it. So they can eat, a, they eat a wide variety of different caterpillars. Um, farmers love them because if you have a lot of ground beetles and carabidae uh, species beetles in your field, they're providing a lot of free pest control, keeping things under control. They do like mulched areas. And some, if you're going for a walk or a hike out in the woods, you can find them quite a bit during the day. Sometimes you have to roll over rocks. Um, tiger beetles you'll see running across the path in front of you and other ones are more active at night. So it's one of those things that most people don't realize are out in the garden, but they are a very important source of free pest control. But these also, um, do they have the self-defensive mechanism of uh, emitting an odor if you pick them up? Some do. So mm -hmm. some of them, if you, uh, catch them in your hand or poke at them or pick them up, they can emit an odor. And there's another group of beetles that actually emit a, a very acidic type poison, but that's not part of this family. They feed on plants, I believe. They're not predators. Yeah. Speaking of predators, see, when we, we discuss stink bug if you're from the northeast you are going to say how can you add stink bug as one of our friends well that's when we differentiate in many different subspecies within species so we are not referring to a plant eating stink bug or a brown marmalated how do you say that marmorated marmorated stink bug, which Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, you don't even want me to bring those up. <laughs> they are an invasive species, which are get in your house, between your siding in your house, in your potato chip bag, in your fish tank, just everywhere. This is a different type. It's a predatory stink bug, and you can tell him by one of the ways, by the points on his shoulder there. But you can see he uses his, um, his uh, juice bag stick, as Dr. Lester called it. Um, we also call it a proboscis. Um, 
to prey on also called a stylet. Oh, there we go. To prey on some of our pests. So what can you tell us about this predatory stink bug? Well, what they do is very similar to the wheel bug and the assassin bugs. They're in very closely related families and they feed the same way. So even though most stink bugs in the garden are going to be plant pests, they're serious pests with a lot of different food crops. They will damage the plants, they damage the leaves. They're very, very damaging to fruit. Anything from peppers to tomatoes to citrus. Biggest pest of pecans, I think, here in Florida, many other states. Some stink bugs are beneficial because they don't feed on plants, they feed on other insects. Really difficult to tell the good ones from the bad ones. One way is if you see a stink bug and it has a big splash of red on it, this coloration, probably beneficial. It's not absolute, but it's probably beneficial. The pest ones tend to be green, brown, gray, tan. The one in the picture here is probably a spined soldier bug. And it does have sharp points on its shoulders there, but there are pest, cat pest stink bugs that have sharp points also. So even for us, we have to actually use an identification key and a microscope to key them out to figure out what species it is. And there's a lot of species of stink bugs here in Florida. One way you could tell the two different groups, the beneficial ones, their mouth part is only two sections and it tends to be short and fat and stout because they're poking into other bugs. The plant feeding ones, their mouth parts are longer and skinnier because they're poking into a tomato or a green pepper or something. It's a lot easier to poke into, I guess. I don't poke into insects, I couldn't tell you. Well, but they are out there. We do have beneficial stink bugs, so don't think that every stink bug is a pest. And or you could catch it in action like somebody did here. And <laughs> Sure, if, if you've got a good camera and you're handy with it, yeah, take pictures like that, Seth, share them with us. Oh yeah. Uh, okay, now we have either uh, hoverflies, or they're called flower flies. You may think they're little bees, um, but that's just their defense mechanism. They're like, I'm going to look like a bee, so no one will mess with me. They don't have a stinger, but their larvae eats aphids like crazy and other insects. And the adults, they act as incidental pollinators. What's an incidental pollinator means that they're not purposefully going and um, spreading, you know, pollen from place to place. They want the nectar and the pollen happens to get on them and go along for the ride, just like butterflies, really. Mm -hmm. So um, can you tell us about all the different, I know there's many different types of um, hoverflies and the role that they play? Sure, we have a large number of species here in Florida and they really run the gamut in size, all different colors, all different patterns. <clears throat> Many of them do look like some other kind of bee. So if you're in a garden and you see one flying around, you're just, oh, that's just some kind of little native bee, I guess. Well, it's not a bee, it's technically a fly. And their larva, the immature ones, live underneath leaves and gobble up aphids. So, as you're learning, aphids are a very, very common garden pest, but there are a lot of different things that eat aphids. So don't always think that because you see aphids on your plants, you must spray. What you wanna do is look closer, use a hand lens. We obviously have a microscope here. We just put things onto the microscope and we could tell, oh, you have aphids, but you have ladybugs. You have parasitoid wasps that have already killed almost all of them. You have hoverfly uh, larva, you have, you know, stink bugs, there's a lot of different things that are gonna help keep aphids under controls. And hoverflies are very, very important control of them. Very, very, very common. Mm -hmm. Now we have predatory, predatory gall midges. I don't know much at all about um, gall midges, so we'll let the good doctor here tell us. Um, what, what do they do for us? Gall midges are a very large family of flies in the fly order. 
Um, trying to remember the name of the family. It's a really long name, C.C. Demiadae, I think. And some of them are really horrible plant pests. Other ones are very important beneficial insects. There is a gall midge that feeds on spider mites and it gobbles up spider mites. It's one of the few things that will clear up an infestation of spider mites very quickly. Uh, there obviously is a very tiny fly. It's um, the size of a gnat, I guess. You would normally, you know, never know. It might be flying around your head in the evening. You'd never really notice it doesn't stand out, but they can sense, they sniff out uh, infestations of spider mites, lay their eggs amongst the spider mites. And then when they hatch, they gobble up spider mites. Um, so definitely uh, one of the best controls, natural controls for spider mites. They can also feed on aphids. So along with a number of other insect larvae, they help to control aphids, white flies, mostly white fly eggs, I think, thrips. And like I said, the adults, you would, you would never notice them. It's about the size of a, a gnat. Yeah, and you can see how difficult this is probably under a microscope that it was for somebody at the university to even snap a picture <laughs> of them. Oh, tiny fly adults are, there's so many of them, they're literally impossible to identify down the species. I'm not good enough to do that. <laughs> Big eyed bugs, look at this guy. Doesn't he look like fun? And um, you can see why he has his name <laughs> because he has some pretty big eyes and they are small and grayish. A lot of times they're confused for chinch bugs. I don't know why, other than they hang out in the same place. Because they're not even the same color as chinch bugs. Um, same, same family, I think. Is it? They're, they're closer. Well, they've got related, this yeah. little X mark here, similar you know, to chinch bugs. But, yeah, the color uh, is a little bit different in the adults. <laughs> um, what? What happens is, well, first of all, that's a whole other story we could tell you about of whether um, or not your lawn has chinch bugs. Easy answer to that, Dr. Lester, you would say is probably not, right? <laughs> or not in any um, troublesome amount. True, uh, chinch bugs are a common pest of St. Augustine lawns. We very rarely see them at our office. For anybody who has a service that treats your lawn, trust me, they put down more than enough stuff to kill chinch bugs, big eye bugs, ants, and everything else that may have been living in your yard. Yeah. Your yard, most lawn samples we look at are little post-apocalyptic uh, wastelands, basically. But big eye bugs are out there. Uh, they hide in flowers. They'll hide in your lawn. They're out in your garden. They're very, very small. They're about the size of a very large grain of pepper. And chinch bugs, which I think we're, we have next, are about the same size. But big eye bugs are predators. They catch other little insects and poke into them and extract their juices. And that's how they feed. And eggs, they feed on a lot of in, pest insect eggs also, because they're just the right size for them. We don't have chinch bugs next. We have somebody who looks like one. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> chinch bugs tiny. and <laughs> and my new pirate bugs or aureus look very, very similar. They're right. all very closely related also. Um, except the chinch bugs don't have this little white bum like the <laughs> minute pirate bug does here. Um, hence its name, it's extremely small. And what else can you tell us about this pirate bug? It, I know them very well. Uh, the genus is aureus. So we generally call them aureus. There's two different species here in Florida. One on its back legs has a black femur. The other one has a brown femur. Easiest insect in the world to identify. I wish they were all that easy. They are very, is very common. The, if, is it because of the eye patch? No, That's they don't have patch. eye patches. <laughs> uh, they are little carnivorous predators If because I've raised them before. And you feed them with moth eggs, which believe it or not, you can buy a vial of moth eggs to feed your aureus with. And if you don't feed them enough, they'll eat each other until there's only one left. <laughs> uh, when they start off, they're all red. 
then they become like red and white, red and black. This is an adult here because it has no red, it's all black and white. So each life stage looks different. They gobble up thrips. They, they, their favorite thing is thrips. Second favorite is spider mites. And then they'll happily eat uh, aphids, aphid eggs, leaf hoppers, any other kind of little pest insects, either the adults or their eggs. And they're very, very, if you go out and find a patch of weeds and grab some little flowers off those weeds and put them under a microscope, you will find wild kingdom. You'll find a minute pirate bug. You'll find thrips. You'll find mealybugs. You'll find everybody hiding in that little flower because they're all eating each other in there. Mm. Now let's get really small. Mites we generally consider a pest, but there are predatory mites out there that are a tiny bit larger than the pest mites. So what can you tell us about the predatory mites? We have them in here in Florida, and you know, they don't even have names for all the different species. They know that there's more here in Florida than what we've actually identified. Very few people work in this area. You know, there's very few mite specialists. There's no mitologists? <laughs> no, um, I can't remember the name, acarology. Oh. So technically you would be an acarologist. Right. And if any of you have kids that are thinking about what they want to be when they grow up and when they go to college, tell them to go to University of Florida, get a PhD in acarology. You may end up extremely wealthy because there's very few people doing this. And it's an area where, let's say if you're in California and you grow almonds, which is a multi-million dollar business out there in California, and you have a problem with um, plant problem mites like spider mites and other closely related species if you're an acarologist and figure out a control strategy for that you can become a multimillionaire. and the lady who was the university of florida instructor for, in acarology whose class i took that did exactly that she, okay. she drove a much nicer car than i did it was a very nice porsche oh wow so you could, believe it or not, you could do very well in really obscure areas if you become an expert at it and there's nobody else doing it. You might do very well. <laughs> sure, you might. <laughs> yes. But yeah, we have beneficial mites here. So not every mite that you see on a leaf is a bad mite. Spider mites are by far the most common one, but we have other plant pests and other beneficial ones that are going to eat bad mites, along with other insect eggs, thrips, things like that. All righty. So those were just a few of our allies that are out there. And we guarantee you, you have way more friends out there than foes. There's more beneficial, 99% of the insects out there are either beneficial or they're just hanging out, not you know causing any problems. <laughs> so, and even the pest insects, we need to leave a few of them because as you see, these guys who we consider our friends, they, they need something to eat, don't they? <laughs> so, you know, we, we can consider the pests good food sources for these good guys. And it also keeps the, you know, everything in balance. So how are we going to protect them? The ways that we're going to protect them is um, using integrated pest management and making sure the last thing you do is think about a chemical only when that is becomes absolutely you know your last resort, if at all. And once you do, choosing the correct product for the correct problem in the correct manner. And the way to do that is, of course, consult the label, but consult with county extension. You can, if you can get a good picture, email it to Dr. Lester so he can tell you, you know, what, what you have and if any treatment is necessary. Don't just, don't broadcast spray your entire yard. He mentioned the insect apocalypse. I mean, it's, it's, it's happening. The, when they get, lawn samples brought in 
they can't find any living thing in all these lung samples that people bring to them. That's terrifying to me <laughs> that we've gone to that amount of spraying where, you know, where, where we are damaging even our, our friends to where you can't find any kind of bug in, in a lawn sample. So don't also just um, spray because it's a certain time to do so. You know, find out, find out what you're doing and why before you do it. And when I say don't send them to bed without any dinner, <laughs> what I mean is, you know, our friends and the whole life chain, life circle there, everyone needs something to eat. So, you know, the reason that these lawn samples don't have any bugs in them is because everyone has over sprayed over the years. So then that the next group up has nothing to eat, then the next group, up, you know, then the lizards have nothing to eat, and then the birds have nothing to eat, and it just goes on and on and on. And don't use products um, that I should, or, or use products if you have to, that don't affect non-target organisms. And I'll let Dr. Lester also take over from here about how to protect our allies. Sure, those are all very, very good points. Probably the most important thing is proper identification. So it really helps to check your plants and your lawn and everything else going on outside on a regular basis, catch problems very early on, get an accurate identification. I talked to way too many people to say, I had a problem with my lawn or my bush or this or that. So I sprayed it for insects and then, you know, it still looks bad. I'm like, what insects did you spray it for? I don't know. Did you see any insects? No. Okay, don't do that. Find out exactly what the problem is first. Is it an insect? Is it a disease? Is it a lack of watering? Is it a nutrient deficiency? Because all of those have different um, solutions and treatments to them. So feel free to you know send us an email, send me pictures. A lot of, don't. It's it's impossible to send me too many pictures. Good clear pictures. Pictures really really help to figure out what the situation is and what's going on. If we need to see a physical sample, we can tell you that. And then we can tell you, is it a problem? Is it not a problem? Uh, is it an insect, a disease, something else? And then what to use for it? Thing, things in your lawn and landscape are rarely as simple as you walk outside and it just doesn't look right. And you go to your shed and grab a bottle of whatever happens to be there. I don't think that is ever the cure. I don't think I've ever seen that people get so lucky that whatever they happen to grab just so happened to cure what the problem actually really was. So scouting, correct identification, using us for help, uh, not using those broad spectrum sprays, using something that's more targeted towards what your exact problem is, is gonna go a long way towards having a very nice, productive, successful lawn and landscape. And the last thing we hear, we have here is go, go home for them. So here, you know, are ways to attract beneficial insects. They're out there. So you don't have to go to huge special measures. Um, one thing you need to do is control your pest control. And that's what we just discussed in the last slide. Either your natural inclination uh, for pest control, or, you know, maybe you hire someone but control that pest control, make it very targeted. Find out why you're doing what you're doing, not just killing everything. Um, that, that is also gonna backfire on you, that broadcast spraying where you kill everything because the pests are generally invasive by nature. I think we just discussed this in our last, um, virtual plant clinic. And they, they regenerate way faster than all your allies. They, they just do. And remember, you know, survival of the fittest, you're not gonna have a 100% kill rate. You're gonna kill off the weak ones of both, both types. So you've killed off your weak pests. <laughs> you've left your strong pests to breed 
congratulations, you just made a super race of pests in your yard that are gonna be much stronger and more resistant to the next round of pesticides. Isn't it much, much better to just spot treat only where you have a problem, be very targeted, let nature take care of nature. And how you can invite all those friends over is clustered, layered plants and shrubs. Have some areas, if you can, if you're allowed, that aren't frequently mowed, sprayed, or disturbed. Dr. Lester kind of mentioned something about some of the bugs living under the leaves. And this is the time of year that we hear a lot about don't rake your leaves up, don't mulch them up, because there's a lot of critters under them. And maybe you do have to keep a good part of your yard looking quote, quote, tidy, but choose an area where you can at least keep those leaves on your property and don't tidy them up. There's a lot of good things going on under those leaves. And of course, diversity, I say this all the time, diversity is the key to any healthy ecosystem. So different types of plants, different sizes and shapes of plants. Also plants that provide nectar and pollen at different seasons throughout the year, you know, to keep that, keep the, so there's always something there to eat. <laughs> so, and also be tolerant of some pests because again, don't send our friends to bed without any dinner. And what do you say, um, you mentioned slightly about purchasing even antlions or what do you feel about purchasing um, ladybugs, things like that to bring into your yard? For most people, that's not a very good idea. Um, you should have plenty of beneficials in your area. So if you make your lawn and landscape and your property inviting for them, they'll move in. They are, they're already here in Florida. Uh, you can buy a lot of different beneficial insects online, but that's more for somebody who owns and operates a commercial greenhouse because a greenhouse is an enclosed situation. And if you get pests in there, you can get specific beneficials to put in the greenhouse to take care of the problem inside of the greenhouse. It really is not necessary and does not work well outdoors in the great outdoors. You'll, you'll buy them and they'll fly away probably. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's best to, if you build it, they will come. Here are some of the resources um, you can go to. If you'd like a PDF copy of today's program, just email me. I'll show our emails again in a second. And I'll be glad to send this to you, but I got some of this information um, from these publications, plus the University of Florida, you know, has all sorts of great um, publications on beneficial insects, but natural enemies and biological control. Um, here's a blog here from how do I tr attract the good bugs, attracting native bees to your landscape and um, bees, butterflies, dragonflies. There's all sorts of great material out there. And again, if you want this list written down, just email me. I'll send you a PDF of this whole program. Um, and it is being recorded. So it will be up on Facebook shortly. And then within a day or two, be on Hernando County Government YouTube. So uh, parents, grandparents, you know, kids are off this week. <laughs> If you need something to entertain them with, say, hey, why don't you watch this program about bugs? <laughs> Here are our upcoming classes. Um, next Wednesday, I believe it is, Dr. Lester and I will be together again. And what could go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong with that? <laughs> that is uh, the name of the program. And what could go wrong in your landscape? Not sure where we're going with that. We just came up with the title. So we're going to see <laughs> um, how that's going to pan out. We have uh, rain barrel workshops going on all the time. Email me if you have an interest in one of those. December 15th, the shady side of your landscape. December 29th, another uh, Wednesday class I just made up yesterday. Uh, since it's the end of the year and we're all going to feel broke, and prices are rising for everything, budget conscious yard care. Here are our emails once again. If you have any questions, if you'd like a PDF, 
email me at Lily B, two L's in the middle, Lily B at Hernando County dot us or email bill at uh, w lester at ufl dot edu sorry i was reciting that while reading um <laughs> one of the chats um joanne i don't have a, a picture right now of lace wing eggs to show is that is that where they're like on the the each, edge of, each yeah. egg is on an individual little stalk yeah yeah, University of Florida has those. You can look it up. Or the next time we meet in our virtual plant clinic, we can bring up a picture of those. They are really pretty, pretty cool, pretty dainty. And yeah, Susan, we'll talk. Now we don't have a plant clinic this coming Thursday because it's Thanksgiving. Yes, but we will the following Thursday, <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit about lace wings, and we'll I'll show pictures of the eggs. The eggs are very, very common in your garden. If you go out there and start looking under leaves, you'll find them. I found lacewing eggs on my car windshield before. Oh, nice. you, you'll, you'll find them all over the place outdoor. The wall of your house, the fence, they lay them all over the place. Bill is a lot more bug conscious than I am. He sees them <laughs> when I don't because... I see bug eggs everywhere. Yes, because <laughs> he's into entomology. So thank you all for... Thank, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Bill, for joining me again. You're expertise is always very much appreciated and susan thinks we make a good team so i think it works out pretty well thank you everyone and um have a wonderful thanksgiving try not to eat too much but you know enjoy enjoy your time with your family and everyone we will see you next wednesday for what could go wrong see you then all right, thank you.